This is the 25th video of the playlist, The Lie Being, What Took Place in the Garden of Eden. The body of Christ teaches that God, in other words, Jesus, since all things were created through him and for him, Colossians 1.16, tempted and cursed humanity in the Garden of Eden. Every translation for Genesis 2.9 puts God in uppercase. And this is everyone's understanding that the Lord God Almighty made to spring up every tree, including the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Christians have been saying that God, who again is Christ, since he's the one the Father entrusted with all of this work, according to Colossians 1.16 and also in Matthew 28.18, for example. So we've been saying that Jesus tempted humanity by placing that tree in the garden. Then Jesus supposedly cursed the serpent, cursed Eve, cursed the earth, and cursed Adam. Yet all born again know that God hates hypocrisy because of how Jesus dealt with the Jews and that he commands us to bless and not curse. Romans 12, 14. The body of Christ also knows that God hasn't changed, as we're told in Malachi 3, 6, so that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. So while we've historically intensely lied about the Lord's character, held accountable, the born again get offended by the truth that we've been this wrong in our interpretation of scripture and honor Satan when Jesus says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me, Matthew eleven six, and he's the truth, John fourteen six. In other words, blessed is the one who doesn't get offended by the truth. Jesus didn't set us up like Christians have been teaching though I do discern he set us up. This is what I mean. According to scripture, he set us up by allowing Satan to be the ruler of this world, John 12, 31, giving him all authority, Luke 4, 6, because he has been testing us, Deuteronomy 13, 3. And as I've been explaining on the playlist, this test was to reveal to us, specifically the body of Christ, the born again, that even when we're born again, our hearts are still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9, which is why we were given all the warnings on how to work out our salvation in the New Testament. Since Satan has been the ruler of this world from the very beginning and has been a liar and murderer for all of that time, according to Jesus in John eight forty four who set out to be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14, deceiving the nations, Revelation 23, which he does by masquerading as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. I discern he was the one in cahoots with the rest of the fallen angels who tempted and deceived the first humans by placing that forbidden tree right smack in the middle of their front yard commanding them not to eat of it. As already covered, technically, the term Lord God can refer to either God the Father, God the Son, or Satan, since he is the ruler and God of this world, according to John 12.31 and 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So, walking through this graphic, this is my understanding according to Scripture in relation to the new covenant. I discern it was Satan, not God, who spoke to Adam. Since God is ever present, he was also there and has always also been speaking to humanity. But in this situation, I discern it was Satan deceiving humanity. This is the first deception. So that little see-through guy represents Satan and the serpent represents one of the other fallen angels, or vice versa. But I'm thinking Satan took the lead since he's the ruler, the king, 
the ruler of this world and the king of the fallen angels, according to Revelation 9:11. And so he was thinking, um, deceiving humanity, just as I said in my heart that I would be like the Most High, in Isaiah 14:14, 14, 14, and deceive the nations. So he said to Adam. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And this is one way we can know without a doubt that it was Satan and not God, or a fallen angel and not God, speaking to Adam, because we were informed in Hebrews, he that had the power of death, that is the devil given all authority as the ruler of this world from the very beginning, God gave Satan the power of death. And so he used it. And we were informed, not Adam or anyone in the Old Testament, that the devil was a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of it, the father of lies. Since truth came through Jesus Christ, according to John 1.17, and God has been testing us according to Deuteronomy 13.3. It's only been the born again who could have and should have passed this test. Because no one can interpret scripture correctly without his spirit within. According to 1 Corinthians 2.14 which says the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. So everyone before Pentecost was easily deceived by Satan and the rest of the fallen angels, unable to clearly understand, to clearly interpret scripture. They couldn't tell the difference who was actually speaking to them, whether it was God Almighty or a fallen angel. From reading the Old Testament, they pretty much assumed it was always God. It's only the born again who could have interpreted scripture correctly if we're not being a hypocrite about what Jesus taught, since that blinds us according to Matthew 7, 5. He warned us saying, hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly. But as I've been walking through on this playlist, the body of Christ has placed increasingly more logs in our eyes over the past 2,000 years so that we've further and further blinded ourselves to the truth. Beginning with Peter. And God spelled it out for us through Paul who wrote, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman irreproachable, rightly dividing the word of truth and Jesus modeled it for us in Matthew 5 which I summed up on this graphic Matthew 5 21 to 48 he walks through these five areas saying do not murder do not commit adultery do not break your oath eye for eye hate your enemies and says but I say this other thing what he was telling us was I'm not the one who said that right because God does not change and he is not into murder or hate. He tells us to love our enemies. Do not act in anger. Don't lust. Don't make an oath. Turn the other cheek. It's completely different. It had to be Satan saying all those things as I've already walked through on this playlist on another video. It's the born again who were empowered by the Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth. No one else in all of history, including today, has the ability to do this, to know what God has actually said and done. Yet, as I've said before, even the most enlightened Christians he's revealed to me, you know, through whom he's taught me things, do two things, are doing two things. Every single one that I can think of is part of the institutional pagan system we've historically called church. And so with that alone, they have tons of beams in their eyes and others, well, one of them, at least, who is extremely enlightened in specifically one area, the false doctrine of hell, but 
He's very enlightened in other areas, yet still he points to the Nicene Creed. Who cares what other humans say? That's not what we were taught. That's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't say you take your thoughts captive to the founding fathers or any other human being. No. Why? Because every human being has a heart that's deceitful above all things. We were taught to take our thoughts captive to Christ and Christ alone. And so that person, Michael Weber, is also, while extremely enlightened on many points, is also severely in the dark on many points. And Lord willing, God will use this playlist to enlighten him, that he won't harden his heart. Anyway, born-again Christians should have been able to discern this first deception. And we would have been enlightened to it had we taken Jesus more seriously than we've historically done. As I've covered thoroughly enough already on the playlist, and by not discerning Satan's presence in the garden, the born again have easily fallen for his lies throughout the Old Testament, so that we've repeatedly and consistently historically called evil good and good evil, putting darkness for light and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. And God says, woe to such people in Isaiah 5.20. There is woe involved because we've not only been deceived by Satan, who has a lust for murder, we've helped him deceive and murder, as clearly revealed by the so-called reformers of the Middle Ages, for example, again summed up well enough on this series of articles, the link to which I've provided in the PDF file that's in the description. The born again who were called, chosen, enlightened, and empowered to be the light of the world have historically, as a group, and to one degree or another as individuals, helped Satan carry out his wicked schemes. We've all done it. It's as we get more and more enlightened you know, get more and more serious about the Lord that we get further enlightened and break further away from Satan's clutches. So it's not as if I'm saying I'm this super amazing Christian. I've never been deceived. We have all been deceived in many ways and still are in many ways. I know it because he called us to function as a body submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so far, 26 years into it, into reaching out to born again Christians, I've been born again longer than that, but 26 years of reaching out to born again Christians is led by the Lord. Nobody will do that. will submit to each other in reverence for Christ. They just blow me off like you're delusional, super unbiblical and super unloving. And therefore, not honoring Jesus Christ, but honoring Satan, helping him carry out his wicked schemes. Like God, Satan uses people so that by not taking our every thought captive to obey Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for him, the born again have historically allowed ourselves to get both deceived and used by Satan. And yet, if we'd done those two things, taken our thoughts captive to Christ and submitted to one another out of reverence for him, we would have been enlightened, further enlightened, right? You would reveal to me the lies I'm currently believing and vice versa. We could have unity in Christ and that purity and enlightenment would have spread. That's what we were supposed to be doing. And that's what we will eventually do pretty soon here, since we're almost out of time, as clearly revealed by the Messiah 2030 channel. He says, complete my joy, being of the same mind, the same mind with him and the Father, having the same love, the same love that he has with the Father, being in full accord and of one mind, the same mind that Christ has with the Father. Philippians 2.2, 2, this was his high priestly prayer, that we would be united as one, just as he is with the Father. 
The fact is that every minute of every day, every human being is either being used by God or by Satan, since our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The good part about it, God's grace in it, is that he's always using us even when we're being used by Satan, since God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.11. Hallelujah. What that means is that in the end, by the end of the ages, it will all have been turned around by God for his glory, our good, and even Satan's good. Therefore, when we start paying more careful attention now, we can work with God more closely, right? Some are like Michael Weber working with the Lord, but not fully, nowhere near as fully as he could be and make the most of Satan's schemes for God's purposes, which also works for our good as individuals and as a group. It's like how when people have a near-death experience, which moves them to take their life more seriously, and we're now about to have a very near-death experience since God has delivered us to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that our spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. God has let Satan have his wicked way with us, knowing how he's going to turn it all around and use it for his glory by the end of the ages. And that glory is that in the end, everyone will finally fully understand and admit that we are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. In other words, we'll genuinely be grateful for what Jesus did for us. So unlike how the body of Christ has historically been. So I uploaded this video last night, but I'm having to add to it today because of what I did and how God worked it out. Almost right after I finish the video, I watch this short on YouTube. No one in the world has the power that I have. No one in the world, no way in the world, not even in America, have the power that I have. And if you don't think I have that power, in Jesus' name, God strike me. Hallelujah. <laughs> then I wrote this comment, the first part of it, praise the Lord. And then immediately got convicted. And then I got further convicted again this morning so that I made a public confession in the comment, adding to my original comment. And also discerned the Lord wanted me to confess it here. I mean, what timing? This is exactly what I was, what the video is about. How we've deceived ourselves, the truth about our deceitful hearts, that they're deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Here I am saying, I think it's funny, and so are other Christians. Praise the Lord. It's what I'd said that we've all done so that I'm not saying I think I'm this amazing Christian. I'm obviously not. None of us are. Satan's lies draw in our deceitful and wicked hearts like a magnet, like Oxycontin to an addict. But because God loves us, he convicts us. And it's our job and our choice to not harden our heart when we hear his voice and do the right thing. In this case, I discerned it was to make a public confession, to also confess to my husband to whom I'd sent the video writing to him that I thought it was funny, and also add what I'd done to this video. And when God convicts us, everything in our being tries to blow him off. I felt it last night, even while I was asking him for forgiveness. For example, I discerned he wanted me to confess to my husband, who's told me flat out, I'm not interested, not interested in praying with me, you know, adamantly, no, I won't do that, or discuss what Jesus is saying and doing. He doesn't want to do that, and I discern he's born again. God made it very clear to me, which I've covered elsewhere. But because that's his attitude, I made the excuse to myself that it was pointless to confess it to him. But then I did this morning, and for a moment at least, he was listening. Of course, as always, he had something to do. This time it was walk the dog, and we didn't finish the discussion and probably won't, because that's how it goes. But it doesn't matter, at least not on my part. I did what the Lord wanted me to do. 
confess and try to explain to him, you know, the lies we believed about God. And that's what we all have to do, not harden our hearts to the Lord. Do not let Satan get a foothold because he'll run with it and will end up getting further and further away from the Lord, from the truth, as has happened to the body of Christ as a whole for these 2,000 years. And as I've shared on other videos, I talk about different testimonies throughout my ministry of people who I know are born-again Christians who hardened their heart on one point, And before you know it, they're so far from God. And 20 years later, they are seriously demonic. And I'll talk about that on another video. I think I already did on the playlist. Referring to Matthew 12, how we end up being worse than what we were before we were born again as Jesus warned us. So, Father, I pray that you would make a way for me to get through to Michael Weber. In my mind, he's the best one that you revealed to me, since he is very enlightened and also has a humble manner about him. However, my experience has been that those who are more enlightened tend to be super proud when it's revealed to them that there's something they're not enlightened about because of the condition of our hearts. So, Father, I pray that you would override Michael Weber's deceitful and wicked heart and get through to him. Open the floodgates of humility into his life, in his life, in his heart. I'm picturing him like a vessel, a vase and just pour in, fill him up to overflowing, a full measure pressed down and overflowing with humility so that he can receive what you have me saying and that we can finally function biblically, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, taking our every thought captive to Christ for your glory and the good of humanity. Amen.